Instagram. Hello, Facebook. How's everybody doing today? Hope everyone is doing well. Um, it's Friday. It's August 20, it's August, not 27th. It's only the 7th. August 7th is here. What's up? Alton is here. Uh, Mike Rodriguez. What's up, man? Uh, hello, hello. Doing our little Friday Q&A here. If you have questions, want to say hello, whatever, just uh, drop them in the comments of the question box. <clears throat> we have a few that I collected through the week. Hello, Haza, C29. Um, hello, Scott Tixier. Hello, Jefferson Panch, Demi Based Bone. All of you, hello, hello. Uh, waiting for a few people to log on. Also on Facebook, people can drop in their questions. We're going to talk about a few things before we dive into the QA. Uh, I got, like I said, a few questions from the week. So we'll dive into those first and then uh, to your live questions. So the first thing is I wanted to make sure everybody knows Music Marketing Roadmap. It's happening next week, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1 p.m. Central, 11, p. 11 a.m. Uh, West Coast time. It's a free training talking about music marketing and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to talk about on the first day goal setting and planning and then uh, talk about some really kind of specific tactile things on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, specific techniques and tactics for social media and releasing albums and um all that kind of stuff. So I uh, hope you can join. It's totally free. Uh, and that's next week, Music Marketing Roadmap. So I'm excited to do that. It's something I've been thinking about putting together for a long time. So uh, glad finally to be able to do that in this uh, time of having a little bit less traveling to do and a little bit more time to get stuff together. So that's going to happen next week, 2 p.m. Eastern, each day, an hour or so uh, training every day. Uh, it's totally free, like I said, and uh, it'll be in a private Facebook group if you want to join that to watch for, you know, the week kind of after that or so. So I also uh, launched this week a new book. It's called right here. This is the book. It's called Get Language. It's 150 uh, language ideas starting from each different um, note of the arpeggio and kind of giving you a system of how to kind of take your lines and adjust them and use different colors and use different techniques to try to develop your own vocabulary. So if you want to check that out, that's in my store, nickfinzer.store. So thanks for being here today. Glad you could be here. Uh, I want to give a shout out to a couple of things. Uh, Ryan Truesdell and the Gil Evans Project did a great live stream last night. And I know he's releasing a video today of uh, sketches of Spain. They were supposed to do that we were supposed to do that back in May at the Jazz Standard, uh, and we kind of released it. He released that last night on the Jazz Standard uh, Facebook live stream, so that was exciting. Got to hear that. And so what they're doing, the reason I'm mentioning it is because they're doing a GoFundMe to kind of help the musicians that are involved with that. So if you are able to do so, head over to the Jazz Standard live stream and check out the Gil Evans Project by Ryan Truesdell, the live stream they did featuring uh, Riley uh, Moherker playing the role of... Miles Davis, and uh, they have that GoFundMe. So if you can go over there and check it out. What's up? Matt Wilson is here. Hi, Matt Wilson. Uh, I see Luke is here as well. <clears throat> um, so today we're just doing a little bit of Q&A. So I see some questions are coming in on the Q&A here. So Michael Rodriguez, low brass, says, he says, tips for improving range both low and high so i've talked about this kind of on and off for the last couple of weeks of the stream here um, tips for improving your range what i like to think about is um, one playing melodies in those extreme registers because it gets us to play music in those registers rather than playing only um, exercises sometimes people get um, kind of caught up in playing exercises and Exercises are fine, but music is what we ultimately want to be able to use these tools for, right? So the tools being those upper register, lower register, whatever. So I like to play ballad melodies. I like to play just great standard melodies uh, in the upper register and lower register to actually practice making music with those extremities of the register. Now, uh, so that's kind of like the approach, like what to do, the type of things I like to do. Uh, I like to play like how insensitive, like starting on the A above the bass clef, that's one. Uh, if you can do that, that's gonna help build build your range. Um, 
Augie Haas, great trumpet player. He has a book called Build Your Range if you want to kind of check some book out. Um, but I'm definitely not like an exercise person that much. I like to go to uh, playing music. And then I like to think about um, the vowel sound inside your mouth. So basically, as you descend, you want your mouth cavity to get larger uh, to O in the low, low register. O and DO when you're trying to play the pedal register. And then uh, it gets more compressed, more E. So O to A ah to E. In the upper register, you're going to think IE in the tongue naturally kind of comes up, creates a smaller cavity in the mouth, makes the air go faster, helps you focus the air, and um, that's how you can improve your high range and your low range. Um, one does not get better without the other. The, the low range is the foundation. Often uh, trombonists, at least, at least tenor trombonists, ignore the lower register, and bass trombonists tend to ignore the upper register. So um, I know uh, I can see people are jumping off the stream when I'm talking about the things that they don't want to hear. So these are this is so important to take the time to work on the fundamentals and be so f sound with your fundamentals, like playing in those registers. There's no fancy tricks. It's just showing up every day and uh, playing the music and playing uh, with those good fundamentals and playing in those registers to develop them. So you should sound bad at first. That's the big thing. You should sound bad. Uh, if you're practicing things where you only sound good, you're never going to get any better because uh, you're already good at the thing that you're practicing. You have to practice stuff that you are bad at. Um, I find that that's a very difficult thing to break through with students sometimes. Uh, make sure make sure you're practicing things that you sound uh, bad at. Okay, so um, that's it. <clears throat> Build that low range. Uh, use the vowel sounds O, A, and E. O, A, E, O, A, E, O, A, E. And think about it. Uh, A in the middle register, O in the lower register, E in the upper register. So if I have like a skip from a D above the staff to a high B flat, a sixth above that, you go A, E, A, E, A, E. You know, that's how you change those notes. Think about that vowel sound. Uh, I think I posted some videos on YouTube about that too. So if you want more information, you can head over there. Uh, or it's a good idea for a new video because I've been talking about it a lot recently. So Michael, thank you for the question. It's a great one. Feel free to uh, add them in. I see a bunch of them here, which is awesome. Demi Bass Bone, he says, I hope to see you at UNT one day. All right, I'll be waiting for you. Are you uh, when are you going to audition, Demi? Let me know. I'll be looking for you. Um, go back to the questions here. Oh, he's got uh, he's got an actual question here, Demi. He also says, "What do you use to edit, master, et cetera, your music?" I just got a mic today. I use Logic. Um, I usually send off my stuff to get mixed and mastered because that's not my area of super expertise. Um, I can hear it like when I produce a project. I know what I want to change, and I can hear what I want to change, obviously, and I know kind of like what to do, but exactly like for example like i'm oh this needs to be compressed a little bit but i don't know like which compressor is the best compressor you know um i'm, I'm learning you know but i i can kind of help get a natural sound and i've produced a lot of projects so um i have a good idea but in terms of the mixing and the mastering i try to leave that up to a person that that's their specialty so i love working with dave darlington bass hit studios in new york city uh, he's on all of my projects except for the no arrival record uh, that was Positone. And uh, other than that, Dave has done all of my stuff. And Dave is amazing, really great. And I also trust the opinion of Ryan Truesdell, who is my producer. Even though I uh, produce a lot of projects, I need to have my own producer to help me also. So it's a really important role uh, to have on your team when you go into the studio. That producer role can kind of help make or break uh, a session. Okay, Scott Tixier. What Professor Scott Tixier has a question. He says, what do you practice if you only have 15 minutes? Well, I'm a trombone player, so I have to say uh, pitch bends and long tones, uh, the, the fundamentals, you know, the, really the essence of fundamentals meaning sound. So if I can't work on anything else, I'm going to work on sound, which on trombone for me means long tones and pitch bends. So um, that's what I would say. 15 minutes. That's a good amount of time, actually. You can get a good warm up in in 15 minutes. I know some people have like an hour long routine, but you need to have that five or 10 minute routine as well. Uh, 
I used to have a long routine, like a two hour routine. And then I realized how impractical it was and that there's not going to be a time in my life where I can do that all the time except college. So uh, move from that to a more condensed routine. If I have time, I'll work on fundamentals for an hour or two hours. I will do it. But um, most times, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, something like that is all we necessarily get before a gig. So you got to figure out what are the essential things you can do. So for me, those are the pitch bends. And I talked a lot about pitch bends. Uh, yeah, you have long tones on violin too. I don't know. What, I don't know, Scott. What would you do for if you only have fifteen minutes um, on violin? Because Scott's an amazing violinist, also a professor at UNT. Uh, he has a lot of his own projects. We use a lot of similar musicians in our bands. Actually, he's got some great records out. Um, he's great. If you don't know Scott, click on his uh, his little picture in the in the chat here. Um, but yeah, long tones, pitch bends, maybe lip slurs. Lip slurs a little less so at this point. And then articulation. I'll do some articulation exercises that take me from the bottom of the horn to the top of the horn. <laughs> Come on, Scott. I know if you only have 15 minutes, you have something you would do. Um, all right, so let's keep moving here. So yeah, I... To edit mass, mix master, I use logic, and then I usually send it off, or I try to do my best uh, to make it happen quickly. Uh, let's see, some more questions. Feel free to drop them in the chat, put them in here, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram. Here's a question from Ethan. Ethan says, uh, how long have you been playing trombone? Also an advice for a fellow trombone player. Uh, my advice to you is to listen to as many uh, trombone recordings as you can and try to emulate them as best you can whatever style you want to play find some heroes find some people that you can uh, figure out uh, how why they're great and why they're great and how they're great so scott says he would practice double stops and slow scales that's another thing that's so 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 important uh is practicing slow you know i i should have mentioned that when i said that before but uh I even had t-shirts made that say practice slow. I'm not wearing it, obviously, but um, it's so important to practice slow because we often go way, way, way too fast. Um, hello, Toaster Bath. Hello, Joe Sway. Um, keep it slow. You know, Bob Reynolds, the tenor saxophone player, he makes a lot of YouTube videos. He talks about 60 beats per minute, at least that slow. And when you think you're going slower, Steve Teray always used to be in my ear. Not slow enough, not slow enough, not clean enough. Go slow. It's like uh, trying to really deal with the details because the more you raise your floor, meaning the better fundamentals you have, the better your worst day is, uh, the better your best days can be because your worst days are keeping on getting better, if that makes sense. So, you know, uh, don't, uh, what's up, Leo? Don't, don't go too fast, go slow. And uh, scales is good practice. Uh, I guess on an instrument like violin, that makes more sense. you got to get your fingers loose, too. Slow is the key. See, I'm not the only one. Scott agrees. Scott's also a professor. Okay, so the other part of Ethan's question was, how long have you been playing the trombone? I've been playing the trombone since fourth grade. I'm 32 now. So uh, you can figure out the math of how old you would be in fourth grade. So I don't know. It's coming up on 20 years, I would guess. Definitely since I was 12, maybe a little longer. Um, but didn't start really taking it seriously until high school. So maybe eighth grade, maybe ninth grade, definitely ninth grade, but in eighth grade started getting into it. But uh, yeah, 32 now, so about 20 years. Happens fast, man. Happens fast. All right, more questions. Ooh, I like this question. I'm gonna jump to it. I'll get to everybody's question, don't worry. But Josue, the trombonist, he said, uh, what is the key to good vibrato? Oh, and uh, this is a, an essential uh, thought. So Ethan's been playing for seven years. That's amazing. Keep on going, man. Keep practicing. Uh, keep playing. Keep being inspired. But uh, the key to good vibrato is listening to players that have good vibrato. I know it's always the same. It's always the simple answer, right? So the key to good vibrato is listening to good vibrato. I don't like sly vibrato that much. That's a personal preference. I'm more of a lip vibrato. I love Curtis's vibrato and I love JJ's vibrato because I think it mimics um, singers. Uh, I think like 
it starts slow and wide and then it gets narrower and faster. And so I try to manipulate that either with, you know, it's either you're thinking about your jaw or it's maybe your tongue on the inside of your of your chops that's doing the um kind of thing. Uh, but I love Curtis's vibrato and I love JJ's. JJ's really sounds like a vocalist to me. Uh, and so does Curtis's. So yeah, Alton agrees. Alton St. Clair, great trombonist. He's based in Austin right now, but uh, was studying with Michael Deese up at MSU. Uh, was probably moving to New York, except that uh, we have a, no gig. There's no gigs in New York, so there's no no time to, not a great time to move there. But Alton's great. So check out Alton. He's got a great band with uh, Chris Glassman. They have a quintet. You can check them out online. I know they have a record out. But uh, yeah, so good vibrato to me is taking the time to listen and mimic vocalists. And I like jaw or live vibrato over slide vibrato. Um, okay. Yeah, wah, wah, wah. I don't know if it's wah, wah, wah. I think of like, yeah, 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 kind of like Tricky Sam, you know, yeah, 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 that kind of thing. That's kind of what I do. All right, Toaster Bath official. Toaster Bath asked me, who's my favorite musician? That's a difficult question. It probably changes on a different on every different day. But if I have to pick just one, I'm going to pick Duke Ellington. Uh, because he was a master pianist and a master composer and orchestrator and band leader. And he was such a great orator. He was great at speaking. He could tell great stories. Uh, just a great person to uh, all around. Uh, great, great uh, band leader, person, everything, composer. And he wrote so much. His output was so great. And he would write like tunes, but also like works, you know. So his, his output is just so wide ranging that to me, uh, if I had to pick one person, it's got to be, got to be Duke Ellington. Gotta be my favorite. All right, Ali, Emre, Kahan. Sorry if I miss miss uh, spoke there, but what's up, Shark? How are you, man? Uh, he says his question is, what do you work on? Improv what do you do? You work on improvisation with your first year students at UNT. Um, Andrew Rubio is heading to UNT in a few days. All right, see you soon, Andrew. Um, what do I do with first year students? Well, we have a class called Jazz Performance Fundamentals. Um, a lot of our, you know, we have a pre-screening process and we have kind of things put in place that a lot of the students that we end up accepting are pretty well versed um, in, not, not totally, not totally, and we take all kinds of different people um, who really show passion for the music. That's like my uh, barometer kind of is like, the how the passion and the listening and like is the student hungry to get that knowledge about this music and so um, first year students often do have a background in in playing jazz so what I try to do in the first year is introduce them to a lot of the fundamentals that we talk about like the fundamentals of developing language which is like that book I was talking about earlier this new book of mine it's called get language it's just an approach to the basics using bebop scales and diatonic two fives and just getting those basics together in that first year um, and then really just focusing on playing transcriptions and playing different transcriptions in terms of that they do the transcription and then etudes like I give them a transcription that I wrote out and then they'll play that and then going beyond the most important part to me is going beyond the notes and saying not like what are the notes that, are, that they're playing but how are they playing the notes Where's the emphasis? Where's the accents? How does the eighth note flow? How does it compare to classical music or whatever other type of music they're used to playing? Um, how are the tones and the time feel different between different players? Can we mimic JJ? Can we mimic Curtis? Can we mimic Slide Hampton? Can we mimic uh, their favorite players? Maybe Steve Davis or Steve Ture or Wycliffe Gordon, whoever it might be. So for me, it's about listening, developing those fundamentals of language, uh, and then trying to mimic the masters. Uh, that's kind of the game the whole way. So I kind of dive into that right right straight away and uh, have the students work on that. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Andrew. Um, okay, there's one from, there's a couple from Facebook. I'm gonna jump over and add those in. Andrew from Andrew W, I can't say his last name. He says, question from left field, what do you think of 12-tone jazz? Any favorite albums? Um, I don't know if I have a specific opinion about 12-tone jazz. Um, 
12 tone jazz would be like using all 12 notes. I think, I mean, I'm not sure what artist you're thinking of. Um, I guess I don't necessarily hear it that way. I think, you know, if you just mean free, that would be different. Or do you mean like super organized 12 tone music? Because to me, that's super hip if you can actually make it sound like music. I mean, I'm definitely a person that likes melodies, uh, but I also like science projects. I kind of, I can kind of be all over the map. I don't know that I have a specific opinion actually. Um, I do like avant-garde weird music though. So, you know, who's really organized about this, who I would send you to, you know, a couple of people. Well, one, the first person that comes to mind is a guitarist named Miles Okazaki. And Miles has been posting on his Instagram a very interesting series where he's talking about different shapes every day. Uh, I use set theory to organize my own compositions. So this is something that I do think about. But I guess I don't think about it in terms of atonal. I use 12 tone techniques to compose in a tonal sense for me, myself. Um, so Andrew, I think that's about as much information I have. Oh yeah, Miles Okazaki, so go check Miles out. He plays with Steve Coleman, Steve Coleman M bass, and they do that kind of 12 tone music that's pretty organized. Um, anyway, so that's all I got for you. Um, before this disappears, Ali says, I was a UNT master's student on classical trombone with Vern Kagerice in 1999. Had a chance to play with the Three O'Clock Lab Band. Nice, I conduct the Three O'Clock Lab Band now. Thank you for your answer. You're doing great videos. Oh, thanks, Ali. Appreciate you tuning in. Uh, yeah, a lot has changed since 1999. Unfortunately, uh, Vern no longer with us, but you know we're trying to do our best to honor his legacy for sure. Um, all right. Let me just go through here. There's another question while I'm getting a new one up on Instagram. I'm going to pull this one up from Steve Klugman. He says, recommendation for learning doodle tonguing. So I think the way to go is uh, go with um, Bob McChesney's book because he's the master of doodle tonguing. Go find that Bob McChesney. I think it just says, just called doodle tonguing. Uh, the, the thing about doodle tonguing to me is that it's never usually as clean as I want it. So I try not to uh, think about it too much, but I like to go with the method of However, I would say a rhythm that I want to articulate it that way. So there's like kind of doodle in there and double and single. So sometimes so to me it's about developing each part of the articulation separately. So it's the do, it's the ol, it's the da, it's the g, it's the single tongue, and trying to make them all speak equally. So um you don't really need a book for that. You just have to play the same language that you would normally play, but hold yourself to that standard. Record yourself, make sure it's all the same. That's the thing that people don't get is that they don't hold themselves to the standard and make sure that it's all the same. So Steve, I would t send you to one, that McChesney book, two, just start to say, th say the rhythms that you're trying to articulate and try to play that into the horn. And um, if there are some syllables that aren't as clean, you want to focus on those and making them cleaner. So that's probably the ol. So that's why I don't really do it, except for if I go There might be a little bit of doodle-ing in there, but there's not necessarily, but if I just go it sounds like, to me, in my playing, it sounds like there's like a cheesecloth over my tongue and I can't articulate. So that's, uh, that's not something I focus on that much. All right, from Joe's Way, the trombonist. I've been playing jazz for one year now how would you attack the topic in improvisation listen transcribe listen transcribe listen transcribe try to play exactly like the masters you're transcribing that's how you got to get the music in your head you can always learn scales and licks and blah 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 but if you don't have the feel and the sound and the swing in your ears there's no way you can play the music unfortunately so listen as much as you can find great players that you love and uh, go from there Hello, Chris Garcia. I see your hand there. Hello. So Joe's way, that's what I would say. All right. Some more questions here. Uh, there was a good question. It disappeared. Oh, here it is. From WN Trombone. Um, you're welcome, Steve. From WN Trombone, he says, do you think diet can affect your playing, i.e. consumption of caffeine, salt, etc.? cetera? Uh, okay, so I don't know. I think there is something to hydration some people say that they need to be um, be drinking a lot of water keep their chops wet um, i think being in the best physical state you can for yourself is going to help your playing however 
I'll just say this from my personal experience. You know, for me, I have a, a very acidic body chemistry. So I eat through my trombones really fast. So if you look at this trombone, you can see there's a patch here on the horn. And you can see that this is all worn. And I got this horn in 2014, end of 2014. So it's five or six years old. And it's already got that much wear on it because I have acidic body chemistry. So um, that can happen. I don't necessarily think it makes me play better or worse. It does, it does affect the, the horn, though, um, in terms of that. But um, so when I was in college, I was a lot heavier when I graduated from um, Eastman, about, mm, you know, 175 pounds more probably than I am right now. And um, I noticed the difference when I lost a bunch of weight that I had to redevelop my sound, for example. And kind of the more that I got into exercising and working out, um, that it developed a lot of tension in my neck, um, trying to like lift and do weights and stuff, or even like strenuous biking or running, it kind of really developed a lot of tension. So the thing that I uh, recommend is number one, you gotta be healthy uh, and happy with yourself, number one, and just in general, to be able to, to function as a musician. So whatever you need to do health-wise, you need to do. Um, for me, I don't like my chops being wet, so that has never been a thing for me in terms of like, I mean, obviously you play better if your mouth is not dry, for me at least, so making sure you're properly hydrated and, and stuff like that is important. But um, the biggest thing in terms of that for me is it was then when I lost a bunch of weight and then having to kind of redevelop my sense of playing, like the sound, the chord of the sound. I think as your body is vibrating, you know, along with, the horn so if you don't have if you have less mass it's going to change the way that the sound is so um, that's something to think about not but you need to be healthy first in order to function so i'm not you shouldn't like not deal with your health just because you think oh man something might happen with my sound you know because it's like well you have to be a human being as well as a musician so um there's that so that comes to mind uh there was something i saw luke said something he said I've had experience with salt affecting the inside of your mouth and causing more dryness. Too much caffeine gives me the shakes. Not good for reading. Fair. Very fair. Uh, yeah, too much. Too much of anything is not good. But um, I guess, yeah, if we have dry mouth, it's not advantageous for playing. And if you get the shakes, then, yeah, that's no good either. Um, but I've also gotten the shakes from fasting for too long. So it, I don't necessarily know that it's one thing or the other. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't uh, think too much about it. Try to maintain a balance, WN trombone, uh, and uh, you'll be cool. Figure out what works for you. Everyone has a different body chemistry and has a different, uh, you know, different way of dealing with these things. All right, here we go. Here's a question from Ellie Zondor. Sorry, I can't read your name. Um, my apologies. He says, are you a K-pop fan? I don't even know really what that music sounds like, so probably not. Uh, what's your favorite tempo? That's a good question. Toaster bath, again, with a great question. What's your favorite tempo? Um, I like calling like New York fast tempos because people think trombone players can't play them. And so every band around the country that's played with me hates me for doing that. Uh, so that tempo would be like, I like to play Lover or Cherokee. And I used to see Wycliffe Gordon doing this when I was growing up. He would just play so fast. And like, it just gives such energy, you know? You don't have to play fast all the time. And you can improvise slow when the tempo is fast. But, you know, it's like, one, two, I want to. That one. I don't know what that is. Like, bet, be, do, 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 be, do, 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 three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, something like that. That's a good one. I also like slow tempos too. So I'm not a fan of, uh, my least favorite tempo is medium, slow, that doesn't feel good. That's the worst, where it keeps dragging on and on and on and on. So, uh, you know, I don't know. That's Those are some tempos. I like fast tempos, slow tempos, medium tempos. That's a funny question. All right, other questions here. Did I get all these? I think so. A lot of blank questions. Um, that's not a question. Encore clarinets. I think that's more spam. 
Lots of spam these days. Uh, yeah, hit the link in my bio. Let's connect. Not a question. That's okay. All right. Well, um, so yeah, that's maybe that's it for today. And if there's no other questions, I appreciate you, everyone, being here. Um, again, next week we got the music marketing roadmap, totally free if you want to join that. Um, we got the new book, Get Language. It came out this week. There's the book. It's blue. You can find it on my store. And um, I think that uh, I think that um, that's all the new things. School starting soon for me. Hope everybody's staying healthy and uh, wearing their masks and just trying to get through this time and uh, hopefully working on something productive. I see another question from DJ, so I'll get DJ's question in here. What do you do when you're trying out a new horn? How do you know it's the right one? Um, uh, I play it for somebody I trust, send them a recording if I'm really considering it. Um, what I've learned about new horns uh, or playing a new horn is that how it feels is not as important to how it sounds, but that's just for me. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend for you that you take this 100%, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But I, the first night, quote unquote, you know, new horn that I got at the end of college, I went with, I wanted it to feel easy to play, right? And it ended up leading to a lot of limitations of how it sounded because I was more um, interested in how it played. So now I kind of take the opposite approach and I want it to sound more and more like what I have in my head, the sound concept that I have in my head. So that might mean that I feel like it's hard to play. Um, but if it gives me the sound that I'm looking for, uh, and then it's a striking a balance because, you know, like I played a 525 version of a Shires that's very similar to this 3B plus that I play all the time, but it just had too much symphonic quality to it. It would lock into like a certain, I don't know, like it feels like this. It feels locked in. Maybe, maybe you know what I mean. Uh, as whereas with with the king, it's it's not as locked in, and it gives me a little bit more um, variability. So that's that. But so I would I would go with what do you want to sound like, DJ? And then does the horn allow you to sound like that? You know. And then there becomes the practicality of what ensembles do you need to play in? What type of gigs are you playing? Is it the appropriate equipment to get the appropriate sound? all of those different kind of things, they all play into it. But um, I am a person that likes to have one horn. I don't like to have, some people, I know there's a great, really legendary, great trombonist in New York, doubler, all over, plays all over, Sam Burtis. He's on all over the trombone forums and stuff, Sam Burtis. And he likes to talk about the right horn for the right job. Um, but that just has never been good for my chops to switch all the time. Maybe I just never trained myself to do it, so it's my fault. But um, I like to uh, stick with one that allows me flexibility to have the different type of sound concepts that I want to have when I go to play. So hopefully that helps, DJ. Um, I mean, that horn that you were playing out, DJ was trying something like a BAC, I think it would look like. Uh, it definitely sounds different than your king. I noticed, I noticed it right away. Um, so anyway, that's trying out new horns. I'm not the, if you want to ask questions about new horns, you know, you should go talk to is James Burton and uh, tell him I sent you can that cause I'll, that would be funny. Uh, but James is really knowledgeable about um, different like, you know, lead pipe things and different um, crooks and this shape and that shape. Uh, it's never been like a huge thing that I've gotten into, so. Uh, I mean, I try to be as knowledgeable as I can, but um, there's not there's only so much time in the day. So um, I, I'm more about the music than the equipment personally. But you gotta you gotta go with what's gonna give you the sound that you're looking for. That's where I'm at with with the horns. So you know, I'm still on the search too, but uh, I don't really like to switch all that much. So it takes it takes something that's a bit different to get me to switch, rather than just like us slightly better. And I'll be like, eh, it's just slightly better. Uh, for me, it's all about like making a uh, if it can if it can make a big change towards my sound concept, then then I'm then I'm into it. All right, okay. Well, I'm gonna wrap up for today. I've got some things to do this 
afternoon. So thanks for being here. Check out the Music Marketing Roadmap. Check out Get Language. Check out YouTube. Lots of new videos all the time over there. And uh, appreciate you all being here. And I'll see you next Friday. Uh, each and every Friday we do this Q&A. So 1 p.m. Eastern time is when we start the Q&A. So feel free to send me questions throughout the week or uh, we'll see you then. Take care.